Pretty much the word equanimity is, means peace of mind. It's a calmness around how you feel about yourself. Stress is determined by the degree to which you feel in control or out of control of your life. And stress, in most cases, is, it comes at us from areas outside of our control. A lot of it can be in our mind, but in things that happen on the job and at work. And an interesting statistic, whether you knew this or not, the number one day of the week where men have heart attacks is the, the greatest number of heart attacks, rather, is Mondays and Monday mornings because they start to think about the impending nature of the job, work, work or otherwise. And it could be that they've, you know, played up on the weekend uh, harder than what they probably should have. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight are areas in which you can fill your cup and turn up and not not uh, well, turn up on a Monday morning and not have that uh, that heart attack, which you know we obviously don't want. Um, a funny story for me years ago, I, I worked on Men's Fitness Magazine for six years. I was the in-house personal trainer, and as a result, I got to test all of the fitness equipment. And I've been using a MyZone uh, for probably the last I don't know since 2010. It would be so I've got a pretty good status going there, and. One of the, you know, my zone was a new product back then. And so I got to test it and I used it and it's brilliant. And so I love the way you guys are training with that. They say if it's measurable, it is manageable. I personally, I can't find my, can't find my my zone watch at the moment. It'll be either in some gym bag or another. But to me, it used to be that if you didn't take the protein shake after the workout or you didn't post the workout to Instagram, did you really do a workout? And quite often I'll head out the door and I'll think, oh, don't have the my zone on. I still have to do the workout, but I, I spend so much time looking for this thing to make sure that the workout counts. Uh, but again, you know, that's measurement and that to me is, uh, is exercise. But when I was working at Men's Fitness, there was a product called Reactivate by a brand uh, company called Musashi. And they sent it to me one day and, and I would have it. I would have it, you know, like half an hour before my workout. And it was a pre-workout shake and it had... Uh, like beta alanine in it. And if any of you have ever taken a pre-workout shake that has beta alanine in it, it actually makes your skin start to tingle uh, if you haven't started exercising within that time. So you can kind of go, oh, getting a bit of tingle, I better get in, into the workout. And uh, they sent me a new, um, I thought they just rebranded it and it was called Reactivate and it was in a darker sort of pan or, or tub or whatever it was. And it was a Monday morning and I was, I had taken uh, the three scoops, which was the measurement, taken the three scoops of this reactivate, and I'd started doing my journaling. And as I'm doing my journaling, about 15 minutes in, I've got this boom, big thud in my chest. And I thought, oh, it's Monday morning. This is what they're talking about. Here am I journaling so that I've got peace of mind and I don't have to worry about, you know, the heart attack and all that sort of business. And it really stopped me in my tracks. And I started sweating and I started panicking and and then, you know, it was, it was about quarter to five in the morning. And I looked at the instructions. This was a new improved version of Reactivate. And you only needed one, one spoonful. And I'd had three times the, the dose. So I'd pretty much had the equivalent to about eight cups of coffee racing through my system. So uh, read the instructions, even if you don't follow them. So the first E uh, of uh, equanimity, if you like, in, in trying, in, uh, I shouldn't say try, in achieving a work-life balance and, and a mindfulness about how you spend your eight hours on the job, number one is eudaimonia, which is an Aristotelian uh, word, which means happiness and well-being. And I think when you have, and obviously I talk about morning routines, but before you even turn up to work, you have to have a happiness around what it is you're doing. Now, within this uh, group, obviously you guys are successful men and you either have, hold high positions within an organisation or you actually own, <laughs> have the highest position in the organisation in that you own your own companies. Uh, but whether you're the boss or the janitor, you know, stress still hits any of us uh, as we walk in if we do not feel prepared. And so from a preparedness perspective, I always say if you know you've got your ducks in, the, in a row, then everything should be fine. If I've done all my preparation, even as Ben was talking about there, when I worked in uh, in media sales and you would have a budget to get and, you know, you'd, you'd get your budget and you get a good commission check. And I never, I would notice some of the other guys would just, just get there and that would be it. 
And they would always say to me, why do you always over deliver on the budget? Because they're just going to put our budgets up. And that was their way of looking at near enough was good enough sort of thing. So to me, even with the my zone, it's always putting that little bit extra in that actually helps you in life. And so when I, we've talked about exercising as part of it, to me, life rewards action. This watch, as I say, it's kinetic. If I don't wear it, it stops. So even yourselves, well, if we don't keep doing what we're doing, then we won't be rewarding ourselves and we won't actually have an active lifestyle. And we're actually training for health span, not so much lifespan as far as uh, that's concerned. But when you have an overarching theme of happiness to your life, because a well-ordered life will give you that, and knowing that you've put your morning routine into place, you've done your journaling, you've meditated, you've exercised, you've taught yourself a little bit, and you actually go into work, whether it's in the office, out in the field, or, or on the tools, with a sense of happiness and that eudaimonia, then that's the word, uh, the well-being. The way I, I like to remember the word eudaimonia is like eudaimonia. You know? So for me, if I'm thinking eudaimonia, it's because I know I've got my stuff done. And it's that positive self-talk that will help me get into that realm. Now, the second E of equanimity is ego. And I say, leave it at the door. Before you get to work, leave the ego at the door. Your ego is one of those things, depending on what obviously life stage you're at. When I was early 30s, my ego was through the roof. It was, uh, I was so, I wouldn't say arrogant because that was, I don't like the word, that's probably wouldn't say it, but I guess I was probably arrogant. I didn't, see to me, the reason why I wouldn't say arrogant I believe that arrogant people are rude to cab drivers and mean to waiters, people in the service industry, and there's an insecurity about arrogance. Uh, for me, confidence is the opposite of arrogance and planning, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. My idea of prior proper planning prevents poor performance, ensures that I'm walking into a situation with confidence that I've done all my homework and everything's going to go. But at that age, when I say 30, it's 25 years ago now, I just I kind of had this bulletproof um, idea about myself that I was unbreakable, unshakable, and that stuff like stress didn't bother me because I had, you know, everything was, was, was in its place. But then that ego did creep into a belief that I was better than other people. Um, and I've since learned humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. So when uh, Ben was introducing me and I thought, oh, I've got a bit of, you know, I felt quite humbled by that introduction because I don't look at myself that way anymore. I try to get out of my own head and I think that's another thing I'll talk about later on. But when you're very, very self-focused, you start to lose touch uh, in humanity and the people around you. And I think that's where ego is one of those things I say, leave it at the door and do it if you say you're going to do it. Faxi facus is what it is in Latin, which is do what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to do something, do it. A lot of ego is about talking about things. You know, if you want to be a writer, write, Epictetus said. A lot of people talk about a life that they're living, that they're not really living. Fake it till you make it is one of those things you often hear said, whereas there are people who have made it and still fake it, and they don't realize they're doing that, and that's ego. And ego is the enemy. Um, quite often, you blokes will ask me about the books that I read. And there's a book by Ryan Holiday, who's a very well-known uh, stoicist, if you like. He writes about stoicism. And his book, Ego is the Enemy, is a really great book uh, to read, if you like, um, particularly in the, around how you hold yourself in the office, in the field, or with your, your staff. Um, you know, I've always, you know, I trained my kids the way I trained teams that I've trained the way I wish I was trained. I raised my children the way I wish I was raised. And as a leader in business, I led my teams the way I wish I was led. I've had some really bad egotistical bosses that I've worked for in the past. And as a result, I didn't ever want to be like them. So when I was in my 30s, I actually didn't hold a position of leadership at that time. I mean, I was the, the sales director, but I also worked in the field. So in that case, I didn't you know, I, there's the movie the Gallipoli, or well, it actually really did happen, but the, the scene where Mel Gibson's charging through the trenches to get to the, 
the beach and the English commanders are sitting on the beach drinking tea and they have no idea that there's about to be, you know, that the soldiers didn't have bullets in their guns and so they sent 55,000 Anzacs off to be slaughtered. Uh, my idea of working in the trenches and, you know, I'd say if, you're, if you can show the people you work with that you're happy to get on the tools yourself, then that's the removal of ego. And that is, you know, um, there's a great quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, every man I meet is my master in some point in that I have learned from him. And for me, it wasn't so much about I learn from my, my team. I would actually ask them questions about how we could be doing things better. My, my teaching or training of them was around the lines of what do you think, how do you think we went just then? Where do you think we could uh, go better? And so them telling me would be like, wow, that's a really good, interesting, that's a good insight. I wouldn't have seen it that way. And so taking ego out of the equation, I think gives you another, a lot of peace of mind because you're not writing checks your body can't keep and you're not, you know, it's, it's, it takes away from, which I think is the third E, which is emotional intelligence. Um, with emotional intelligence, I say you have to remove emotion from a lot of the decisions that you make. Uh, it's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business is what Michael Corleone said in The Godfather. And I think when you can learn, even in a boardroom situation or in a, in a customer interaction, if you remove emotion, knowing that this is business, it's not personal, then there's a lot of ways in which you can communicate to your staff. I would say to people, and I would teach people who I'm working with from a work-life balance perspective, if they're having staff troubles and they, they find it difficult to break bad news to people, it's this is what the business is asking of us. It is business. It's not personal. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us own our own businesses and in owning our own businesses, sometimes it becomes a family business. And, and you know, that's, I like the idea where companies say family first, uh, but you have to actually live by those guidelines. And, you know, when I hear of companies say, oh, you know, we're like a really happy family, it's, it's a sense, it can be dangerous because nepotism is, is frowned upon in a lot of companies. A lot of companies don't encourage nepotism, the hiring of family, because they see how it can go wrong. You know, you can't fire, well, you, you can fire your family, but that's going to end in tears. Um, I also learned early on in hiring friends of friends so or, or, or siblings of friends. Uh, one of my grooms for many years ago, I hired his sister-in-law and I had to let her go because she just couldn't do the job. And, you know, I've, when I say I've never hired, I've never fired anybody I've hired. I've had to let people go that I've inherited. But the process of hiring for me, when I talk about emotional intelligence, it really is a process of mindfulness and thinking about that person and how well they fit in with the business. So if I had hired somebody, uh, I've gone through a very rigorous two or three or four, at least, interviews to make sure that, that person stayed within the company because of the right decisions. And if they were showing signs very early on that they weren't going to work, then very early on I had the hard decisions that were, and I say this to people, if you've got three months within which to you put somebody on uh, probation, whether it's three or six months, it's generally, they will show you straight away whether there's problems. And so you use the probationary period to say, you know, we, we both have to part ways. And if someone's going to fail, they have to fail fast. Now, emotional intelligence or EQ, as it's now known, is looked upon in some organizations as, as more desirable of a trait than IQ emotional intelligence. I know some highly intelligent people who are very, very disconnected emotionally from reality and from people. And so they don't have the, uh, the empathy, if you like, to, to have good relationships with people because they're thinking from a very linear, brainy kind of perspective. Um, within emotional intelligence, uh, I say, write your own job description. You know, you might write a company and I work with a lot of companies and I get in there and I say to, to the people that I'm working with, what are your KPIs? And when somebody says, well, what's a KPI? I think, wow, that's an interesting, you don't even know what a key performance indicator is. And I say, do you have a job description? And they say, no. 
And I think, right, I've been called into this company to help them sort out staff who are have uh, typically high potential or could be a high performer, but are also but are considered more trouble than they're worth. Um, and so I, when I sit down and I think, well, you don't even have a job description. You don't know what your KPIs are. Here's the problem. Then I say, if you were to write your own job description, what would you say it is? And that's what we do. We get people to write their own job descriptions. But even for CEOs and, and uh, people who own companies, if they started the company themselves, they just know what they do and they're very, very good at it, but they actually haven't written a job description for themselves. And so I encourage you to write your own job description. And as far as emotional intelligence is concerned, um, have really good internal relationships with your people. And that is on a get to know them perspective. You know, there's, you know, you know, do as I do as I say. I had a boss once and he said, you know, why aren't you working? I said, I didn't see you coming. And I was joking. But the point of it is, you know, when you have really good internal relationships with your staff and with your team or even with the leadership team, then you're more likely to have people working hard for you because they respect you rather than fear you. Machiavelli said in his book, The Prince, uh, would you rather be feared or loved? Uh, feared because I can control fear. And he would say, as a leader, it's better to be feared. Um, me, I think of respect. And respect is because people see that you have the emotional intelligence to be doing what you're asking of them or to articulate to your people what it is that you want them to do. Um, and I think then with emotional intelligence comes mindfulness. To be, to be present at work, for you to be truly here, thinking has to stop. Thich Nhat Khan said, who's the, uh, the Asian philosopher, the, the Buddhist philosopher, who you really, from a presence perspective, an emotional intelligence perspective, it really is about being present. Eckhart Tolle said that he believes stress is man's inability to be present in the now. And so for emotional intelligence, you want to get rid of those negative thoughts because you're not your thoughts. Thinking about that as well, throughout the course of the day, we have six and a half thousand different thoughts, but you are not your thoughts. You, your thoughts can actually lead you to become your thoughts if you're thinking stressful thoughts. But the idea of saying, right, I'm going to remove emotion from this situation, but I'm going to mindfully be present in the here and now, what I'm doing from a, a job perspective and thinking about it from how you are feeling that's going to give you a lot more peace of mind at the end of the day on how you've actually attacked that. Uh, now, the fourth E uh, of equanimity is excellence. We are what we repeatedly do, Aristotle said. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And when I talked about uh, hitting budgets and things like that and my other teammates saying, excuse me, why do you, why do you go over and above it? It's because... I had an attitude of excellence. You know, it, to me, it wasn't about near enough is, is good enough. There used to be an old Advance Australia a slogan when I was a kid, one of the ads, Advance Australia, and it'd be like, oh, she'll be right, mate. And, you know, near enough is good enough. And that seemed to be the theme or the feeling that the country was trying to overcome as far as getting people out of the idea of just near enough will be good enough. You know, just sliding in. Is, is just lighting in. What I find amazing is whenever I watch a game of uh, any sporting game and the last minute before halftime or the last minute before the end of the game, you see the best football you're ever going to see, whether it's soccer, rugby league, union, AFL, because people are under pressure. They've got that that time uh, goal going. And you think to yourself, wow, that's that's good footy. It's good, it's good play. But I think it's also the idea that from an excellence perspective, you know, the pressure's on uh, and it's very difficult to play that intensity for 80 minutes or 90 minutes or however long the game is. However, over the, cross, over the course of an eight-hour working day, the idea of having an attitude of excellence is just, it's, my cousin came out from Ireland many years ago as a journalist. He now runs one of the major newspapers in Dublin. And he said to me, he asked me, he said, do you believe you're the best at what you do in your field? And I said, I'm pretty good. You know, I was about 30 at the time. I said, I'm pretty good. He said, you have to believe you're the absolute best at what you do in order for you to become the best at what you do. He said, I, I said, he said, I believe I'm the best journalist this country's ever seen. And, you know, he was like a 30-year-old, no, I wouldn't say backpacking Irishman, but he was, 
he was here to have a good time and he certainly did live with me for about six months and they were crazy six months of my life. But the point of it was he did believe that, he had that, and, and in believing you're the best at what you do, you don't sit back on your laurels. You actually play to that level of excellence. Um, the, other, the other idea of having an attitude of excellence is the Latin phrase, premeditatio malorum, which is the premeditation of evils, or in your day-to-day -day work, thinking what's the worst thing that could possibly go wrong and do everything in your power to make sure that it doesn't go wrong. And that's planning. And so, you know, Robert Greene, the author of 48 Laws of Power, said, for the future, the motto is no days unalert. And I think the idea that you could look at each day, you know, as the first day of your life, because certainly the first day of the rest of your life. But, you know, they're saying I was today years old when I learned this. Um, you know, the, the, the turning up every day to play at 100% in the workforce, you then sleep very, very well at night because you did the best you could do. It's, there is a, um, I don't know what the process is called, but it's life maps. You may have seen them. Um, you can buy them for 88 years or, or 100 years or 125 if you're optimistic as the ad goes. And what the course of it is, it's to plot out the average human lives 4,000 weeks, uh, they say, uh, which means half of us live more and half of us don't. But if the average lifespan is, is 4,000 weeks, this uh, calendar, if you like, has dots on it and you buy it and then you cross off every year you've already lived. And so there'll be however many weeks that you've crossed out and then the remaining space between 88 or 105 or whatever it is, is what you mark off each week. And if you're doing this of a Sunday evening and you mark off a, another week and you really feel you haven't actually put in for that week, it's a week you're never going to get back again. And it's a week that you're going to regret. And so for mine, the idea of saying, okay, um, I have to have an attitude of excellence in the time I'm on the job and I'm working is what makes that ticking off of the week each Sunday night and the, the uh, closing off of that day a lot more peaceful and rewarding than thinking, wow, I really bludged today. <clears throat> when I tell the story of my father, me asking my father when I was eight years of age, when do you believe you die? And him saying you die the day you stop learning. And of an evening, you think, oh, wow, I really didn't learn today. And having to go and grab the Encyclopedia Britannica and learn something that to me would have been a wasted day. That was what my father's point was, is that when you don't learn, you're actually not getting any better than what you were yesterday. And little by little, a little becomes a lot. And an attitude of excellence where you put in 100%, it's not, it's, when I say little by little, a little becomes a lot, you're going to be better than who you were yesterday. And you're going to do a better job rather than go, oh, all right. You know, there, there seems to be a lot of workmen around this area, you know, a lot of people doing a lot of work on their houses and throughout the course of the day, I might be on a call and I'll be looking out the window and I'll just see workmen sitting there on their phones and it's not lunchtime. It's, I don't know what, but they're just flicking through Instagram. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, if you sit in an office, LinkedIn for mine is just, you know, it's social media for, for businessmen. And, you know, you might, oh, well, I'm, I just connected with the CEO of whatever, but just, you're just scrolling, which leads me into the fifth E, of equanimity, which is eliminate. It's the ability to say no. So what you, you say no to is what gives you more time. Uh, my brother said to me once, <clears throat> you know, dad said no to every single thing that he was ever invited to or ever asked of. And I said, yeah, well, it would have been easy for him to then change his mind and say yes. And I think even myself personally, I don't commit to anything that's more than two months down the track. I don't know what's going to happen more than two months down the track. <clears throat> and when people in my life who are very, very important to me say, hey, I'd really like you to be at this thing with me on this date, do you think you'll be able to make it? And I say, 100%. And then they might say, well, do you want to check? And I say, no, no, no. Well, I, whatever I am in, I will get out of for you. But I, if it's more than two months down the track, I say 100%, definitely. Because I know I haven't committed to anything for anyone. As far as someone might say to me, do you want to speak in Melbourne in June? Now, if they said that to me now, I'd say no, because actually I might say yes, because June's, June and May added up would just be on the cusp. 
but certainly no in July because it's too far in advance and I don't know what's going to happen and I will let them know closer to the date. Or I'll ask, can we do this earlier, in which case most times we can. Um, but the other thing about saying no, it's freeing yourself up to be able to have the attitude of, of excellence and even ask yourself, how many meetings do you attend that you really shouldn't have to be present at? There are a lot of times, you know, particularly through COVID, where you'd say, I was working with organisations and saying, make your meetings 25 minutes, so at least give yourself that five-minute buffer. People would say, I didn't even have a chance to go to the toilet. Or when I'd say, you need to drink 30 mils of water for every kilo of body weight, that means if you're 100 kilos, that's three litres, that's just to survive. I never get a chance to drink water. Why? Because I'm in back-to-back -back meetings all day long. And I say, well, say no. Tell them I will give you 25 minutes or ask, can I have 25 minutes? My meetings are generally 25 minutes. That five-minute buffer gives me time to drink water, check in with somebody important to me, see how the day is going, just get a bit of a breather. Um, so in that case, I'm talking about things like um, I work with a really high executive in, in one of the biggest banks in the country, and she doesn't have email on her phone. I think that's phenomenal. So she works all the time she works. And if she sits down of an evening and gets on her laptop, she gets on her laptop. But an email is somebody else's to-do list. And, I, I, you know, people who get up in the morning and check their phone for work emails before they've got in the office, you're ripping yourself off on your own work. Now, it doesn't matter. Even if you own the company, I think you're not prioritizing life. You know, if you become the job, then the biggest problem you might have later on down the track is an identity belief. Because, you know, when people ask me, what do I do for a living? You know, my answer, you know, I, I, I say two things. I help people get out of their own way or I help them close the gap between great and phenomenal. That's pretty much what I do. But it's not, I don't think about what I do from, uh, you know, before I get into the office or before I get here and start my day because I'm filling up my own cup. And as I say to people, the best thing I can do for you is look after me. And the best thing you can do for me is look after you. And they're the things you do outside of that. And you do that by freeing up time. So even in blocking out time in your calendar. So one of the things I'll say, people say, oh, well, I really, I don't have time to exercise. And I said, what about a lunch break? You get a lunch break? Yeah, but, you know, what? Well, whenever I put exercise in the lunch break, someone will, you know, one of my clients will say they want to see me at that time. And so I drop everything for the client. And I say, well, you're the most important client that you have. And if you had... But, you know, if, if I was working with NAB and Westpac said, oh, could you come and see us on Thursday? And I had a meeting with NAB at one o'clock. I wouldn't say yes. I'd say, no, I have a meeting in the book. And I wouldn't actually tell them who it was because I don't have to. Similarly, if I had in the book, go for a run, have a boxing session, lift some weights, skip, whatever, call my wife, do whatever it was at one o'clock on Thursday, I would say to whoever this important, I'd say, no, I actually have a meeting then. Can we have it at another time? But I'm blocking out that time for me. And in my calendar, I have blocks of time and they're in orange and they say me time. Now, I haven't decided what to do with that time yet because it hasn't arrived. It hasn't arrived. But even on when people ask me to attend meetings, I ask them, can they give me an outline of what the meeting will be? And can they tell me how my attendance will benefit them or anybody else? Sometimes people say, I just need you to be there so that people take things seriously. I'm like, that's your job to get them to take things seriously. Me sitting in a meeting for an hour of my time to make other people, you know, that's not what the best use of my time is right now. And when I talk about premeditatio malorum, thinking the worst thing that could possibly go wrong and doing everything in your power to make sure it doesn't, I also ask, what is the best use of my time right now? Is what I'm doing moving me towards or away from my goals? And if the answer is, it's moving me away, then it's, I'm not going to do it. If when somebody asks me if I can do something, if it's not a hell yeah, then it's a hell no. And I think that's where you need to kind of look at that from a delegation perspective, blocking out your, your, your calendar um, and also having, you know, just doing the most important thing for you as far as things are concerned, um, delegating time and, and things like that. The sixth E is evolution. Now, that's basically just working on yourself and having a growth mindset. You know, where, where across the course of your day can you take some time to think to yourself, is what I'm about to do 
going to benefit me? Am I going to evolve through this situation? It might be an uncomfortable conversation. It might be having a conversation. There is a uh, there is a philosopher, Balthazar Gracian, who said, know how to show your teeth up front. He says even the, a rabbit or a hare can tear at the mane of a dead lion. And his point is, if you have to have an uncomfortable conversation and there is somebody in the workplace that gets on your nerves or, you know, you end up losing it one day and go, Karen, you're just doing my head in then you look back because you've lost the plot. But it's been a series of Karens that have ruined your day every day for a long, long time that if you'd shown your teeth up front or said, hey, Karen, when you bang your glass seven times every time you stir your coffee, kind of gets a bit distracting on my workforce. Could you possibly bang at six? You know, whatever it is that you're actually asking of someone, it's, 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 it challenges you. It's a growth mindset. And you evolve. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the mind once stretched past a certain way of thinking can never return to its original dimensions. And I think when you stretch yourself on the job, in the work, even if it's putting in extra, extra effort, not so much extra time, you know, the idea that if you, you know, work at McDonald's and you take the rubbish out, they pay you $15 an hour. That's great. If you whistle while you take the rubbish out, they still pay you $15 an hour. But if Rather than just taking out the rubbish, you look for other ways of doing this and this and this, you're going to get a pay rise. You're going to get a promotion. One of my nephews one day, he was, I was asking him what he was doing for a job and he was telling me and I said, you're happy? And he said, yeah. And I said, the money's good. And he said, well, you know, it's, um, it's reasonable. And I said, could you get a pay? Have you asked for a pay rise? He said, no, it's a, a grading system. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the pays are all set. He works in finance. And he said, um, so you don't get a pay rise. And I said, well, hang on, how about this? If you turned up an hour earlier and left an hour earlier, try that for a month and see what happens. Now, it was three weeks later that we caught up again because I had seen him. We were watching The State of Origin. And when I saw him the, th the three weeks later, he had been given a pay rise and a promotion. He got a grading system. Now, it's a bit like the Seinfeld episode where George leaves his car in the car park <laughs> and they think he's working long hours and they give him a pay rise. But my nephew actually was coming in an hour earlier and leaving an hour later, but he wasn't just dicking around on his phone. He was actually using that time to be more productive, to see how things could change in the business. And he raised those ideas uh, to the bosses and they noticed him and he got a pay rise. Um, personally, there's a company I work with, Manly Beach Health Club, and I started doing some boot camp classes for them on the beach of a morning, it's a great way to start the day. I'm seeing the sunrise, um, but Friday night we all went out to the to the footy, watch the Manly game, and I got a chance to sit and talk with the owner around some ideas I had on how his business could be more prof profitable, productive, enjoyable. Just because this is it's kind of what I do. I think I look for for ways to improve situations, um, but rather than tell him these sort of things on Friday night, I asked him what they had done in the past and where they hadn't worked. And just throughout the course of that, he called me up uh, yesterday and we had a conversation around the idea of how we could have lunch on Thursday and put some of those ideas in place. And I thought, wow, that's great. That's For me, it wasn't about making extra money, but it was being more involved and evolved. And I think that's where when you look at the evolution of your own self in your own uh, company and within your workplace, it's through stretching yourself. When Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest nor the fittest of the species, which is most able to survive, but those, nor the most intelligence, but the ones most able to adapt to change, he was talking about behavioral flexibility. Now that's a quote from his book on the origin of species, which is where he talked about evolution and the whole evolution theory came about. Um, Evolution and behavioral flexibility is where you are growing. The idea that, you know, a 14 year old these days gets more mental stimulation from these phones, uh, you know, and every other thing they have access to than a 50 year old man would have had in a lifetime in the 1400s is bizarre. So, from an evolutionary perspective, the mind, uh, uh, and I say mind rather than brain, of a 14 year old child will be a lot more evolved, so to speak, whether that's good or bad, than what somebody 
would have, you know, 600 years ago. Um, and so that's where we've got to be careful on where we are evolving. Are we evolving or devolving as far as, as I say, if it's moving you towards or away from your goal, are the way that we're um, behaving with our children or how we're encouraging our children or whether we're even monitoring the use of their phones, um, is that the best use of their time? Is it going to help them evolve? Uh, my, my, I have a pet hate on this whole mobile phone and social media and things like that because I see the effects that it has. And if you think about it, I mean, I'm particularly with what I do, I'm seeing a generation. They say there's four generations in a lifestyle, a lifespan. If the average age is, is 4,000 weeks, it's around about 85, 88. 88 is the, the top mark. So 22, 44, 66, and 88, there are four different generations alive at, at any one time. Uh, the younger generation coming up now who are about 22 are obviously being um, exposed to the different, you know, every different alphabet letter as far as lifestyle choices are concerned. But they're also having a lot of other things fed to them through social media. And from a comparative perspective, their view of themselves you know, comparison is a thief of joy, Eleanor Roosevelt said, and yet social media is all about comparing yourself to others. Now, the 22 to 44 gener generation, they would have been raised or exposed to social media, MySpace and mobile phones and even the digitization of the way in which they live their lives and have their day uh, set out for them. And this is where stress is, is being, you know, more prevalent, and certainly I'm being exposed to it with the people that I work with. <clears throat> it's, the good thing about it is when I say things like if you've let yourself go and have an exercise for three years, all you guys doing the My Zone Challenge will realise you can get back to a better, <clears throat> excuse me, state of fitness, then it doesn't take as long as it did to get out of whack to get back into shape. It's actually a very, very quick uh, evolution, if you like. And similarly, if you feel you've gone off the tracks and you know lost your mind in some sorts, it doesn't actually take that long to get it back if you actually go, right, when I say I help people get out of their own way, if you're stuck in a rut, the, the, the rut is the unsealed part of a country road, <clears throat> excuse me, by definition, and the only way to get out of that rut is to stop the car, see where you went into the rut, get back on track, take a look where you came from, review, renew, reset, refrain the way you're doing things, and then get back on and stay on the path but evolving every single day, doing something from an evolutionary perspective that helps you grow, <clears throat> excuse me, to that uh, measure. I shouted a lot at the footy on Friday night, so losing my voice. Um, the seventh E is empowerment. Now, I often say to people when they're speaking to me, um, what's a more empowering word than the self-deprecating word you just used to describe yourself? Now, when you empower people within your workforce, you delegate. This gives you more peace of mind. Um, if you, you know, the fourth E being excellence, problem, it's great to have an excellent attitude, but also to understand that it's very difficult to be excellent and perfect and perfectionism can ruin you because you're actually trying to be perfect when there is really no such thing. What is perfect? When I say eudaimonia is the, the state of happiness, it is is your pursuit of perfection causing you happiness or unhappiness? So you've got to work out where that's working from, from a is it working for you perspective. So empowerment, when I say to people, some people might say, oh, I'm, I'm pathetic. <clears throat> I spoke on gaslighting not so long ago. And gaslighting might be uh, the definition given to where people, and you know, men and women are just as guilty of gaslighting each other as each other. But when you're gaslighting your partner, you're saying that they're doing things that they're not doing and you're making them believe that they are. And that can be as simple as putting them down and saying, oh, you know, you're useless. You know, uh, if anyone ever watched Muriel's wedding, when the father would uh, build a battler and he's sitting in the restaurant and, you know, Deidre Chambers, what a coincidence, shuffle over kids. And he would describe his kids and he said, look at them, they're useless. They sit around like a pack of dead weight watching television. And he was putting them down. And, and literally, if you see the family and Muriel's wedding, apart from Muriel getting out and becoming Mario, they pretty much sat around like a pack of dead weight watching television. And he had told them what they were going to become. 
But when I talk about gaslighting, think about how you gaslight yourself. Where are you speaking to yourself in a disempowering way? It's not self-sabotage. It's not self-sabotage. It's self-deprioritization. Where along the course of your day are you being too tough on yourself through the thoughts? Thoughts are not, we don't become our, your thoughts are not things. So when you're thinking you're, oh, gee, I just didn't do that. Uh, I talked about call reluctance last week that I used to or the last time I spoke rather, and it would be, I'd think, some will, some won't, so what? And I'd get on the phone and do it. Then when I started to doubt myself, if somebody said no to a meeting or whatever, I took it personally. <clears throat> I shouldn't have. I started to talk down to myself, which wasn't very empowering. And it was a gaslighting effect because it wasn't true. So when I say to people, would you let anybody speak to you the way you speak to yourself? And if the answer is no, then don't continue to speak to yourself in these disempowering ways. So empowerment really is where you're thinking, right, what can I do? How can I empower staff members? How can I, you know, you could be the CEO of your company and somebody in your workforce through you stopping and saying, what did you do on the weekend, Barry? And how did that make you feel? And what did you get up to? And you remember Barry's name. And that to me is a really, really important thing. When Mayor Angelo says people never remember what you did, they'll never remember what you said, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. It's the way you make people feel that is empowering. So whilst you're empowering yourself by self-positive self-talk and by doing the best job you can possibly do, it's the empowerment of others that keeps the company ticking over and the workforce a much better place to be involved in. Now, the final E for mine is evanescence. <clears throat> evanescence, so I'll use the expression bulletproof earlier on. Bulletproof is a song that was sang by a band called Evanescence. But evanescence is the fleeting nature of life, the impermanence. When things are ethereal, they don't last forever. So there are some plants and things that, you know, live for a day. So the idea of uh, considering the evanescence or the shortness of life Seneca says, the man who puts the finishing touches on every day is never short of time. And the, the ability to look at, you know, I talked about the time charts and plotting off each week as it goes by, the ability to think of the fleeting nature of life and its impermanence, it's that deathbed conversation that no one ever had. No one ever said, I wish I spent more time in the office. Um, no one ever said, I wish I spent more time at work. You know, if 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 money, they, don't, they say money is the root of all evil. It's not, that wasn't what was said. It was the love of money is the root of all evil was in the Bible. And the Bible, as I say, it's not a, it's not a, a it's, it's a, it's not a, meta, it's a metaphysical book. It's not a farmer's book. You reap what you sow is not about how to sow more crops. It's, that was karma. That is what you put in is what you get out. You put in a good day's work and you should, go to get, you should get a good day's reward out of that. Now, if over the course of this evening's conversation, when I use the word evanescence, if the fleeting nature of life makes you question what it is you're actually doing for a job, then think about what you could be doing instead of the job that you are doing. Um, you know, somebody had said to me yesterday, actually it was a text from one of my nephews, I send out a quote for the day to all of my clients and I include a couple of my nephews in on them. And one of my nephews is a lawyer and he's pretty smart. And I put out the quote yesterday or today, I think it was, was you're never too old to set another goal or to dream a new dream. That's by C.S. Lewis, who wrote Peter Pan. And my, my nephew wrote, even at 50, and I wrote, I'm 55, and I set goals and dreams every day. And he had said, oh, I forgot about that. How awkward. In times like these, all I can say is I withdraw that statement as uh, a lawyer. But the, the funny thing is that what I was doing, I was working in media and I did that for 25 years and I believed I was pretty good at that. And But I didn't. I thought I was put on this planet for more than that. As much as I was a good sales leader, I, what I enjoyed most about my roles in leadership was the coaching, counseling, leading, and motivating of the people under my command. 
It was the working with people to, be, to encourage them to believe they were better than what they were. So they would then go on and get better jobs. Um, one of my, one of say my greatest success stories, I hired a guy once who just had a lot of drive and passion. He had a lot of enthusiasm. And I thought this bloke's going to go places. He just had no idea where he was going to go. And so I asked him to write down his top 10 goals and he wrote them down and I gave him a, a five ring binder. And then when he wrote them down, he came in and I said, you know, can you share them with me? And he did. And I said, okay, every single day for the next 30 days, I want you to do that. And he wrote them out and he wrote them out and every single day. And the idea was that he should know them off by heart. Um, during the course of that time, I tore one of those pages out. Now, two years later, when I called him into my office and I said, you remember in your first week where I got you to write out those goals for the first month that you were here? And he said, yes. And I said, you remember what they were? And he said, kind of. And I pulled out my top drawer and I said, this is what you said. You said you wanted to do this. You wanted to surf in the Maldives. You wanted to buy a house. I said, you've achieved every single thing on this list except for one thing. What was it, do you think? And he said, I said, I wanted to have your job. And I said, well, I resigned this morning and I put you forward. And he got my job. He, he has gone on to do some phenomenal things. But this young kid, when I say young, he turned up in his dad's suit. You know, he looked like Tom Hanks from Big. And he's turned up in his dad's suit for this interview and was just awkward and clumsy but had a lovely disposition and had good drive. And when he articulated what it was that he believed he could bring to the job, for me, I thought, well, job done, and he got the job. And so I think that's that. The idea that, for me, that's where I got into what I'm doing is because I thought I really love seeing people thrive and fly, and I'm sure I was put on the planet for better things than just, you know, selling advertising space uh, or, or working for, you know, companies to make them very, very rich, and money wasn't what it was all about to me. So from an Evanescence perspective, the idea that here it is Sunday night, close to 930 and putting the finishing touches on my day, I will journal just before I go to bed. And uh, I've done my journaling this morning on the A4, and now I'll I'll journal in the A5, which will be a kind of a, it's a, with my journaling of a morning, I write out my to-do list of an evening, and I have the palm cards off to the side, and I tick them off. And that'll be my to-da list, so that I've had a magical day, and I've put the finishing touches on my day, so that I feel like I've really lived a full day. Um, we had a, a funny kind of start to the day today because it was a bit rainy here in Sydney and it felt a bit lazy. And I kind of settled into thinking I was going to sit around reading and I might have even watched a movie. And then the sun came out and I thought, wow, I have this thing in my mind that because of evanescence and the fleeting nature of life, I can't waste, I, I can't be inside when the sun is out outside. I've got to get out, whether it's a walk, whether it was even, I ended up driving out and having having lunch with my partner. and. <clears throat> it was lovely. You know, I had a yum jar out there. But the the fleeting nature of life and life being so quickly, the idea that remember you are mortal, you can live life right now. I talk about seizing the day, but you've got all day to seize the day, but you've only got this moment to seize the moment. That's carpe punctum. And so looking at your working hour and your life, your working life, and I, I keep talking about the importance of sleep. And they say the best sleeping tablet is a clear conscience. And after I've done my, <clears throat> I believe, a morning routine and an evening ritual, the evening routine or ritual is just as important as the morning routine. And it should be the antithesis of the morning routine. But the same discipline that is required to get up early of a morning is exactly the same discipline that's required to put yourself to bed early of an evening. Now, if you think about it, I, I spoke to somebody the other day. I said, what time did you go to bed? She said, midnight. And I said, well, curiously, why do you think it's called midnight? It's midday because it's the middle of the day. It's midnight because it's the middle of the night. Now, if you think of that, eight hours sleep, prior to the, uh, the age of industrialization, you went to bed at eight o'clock. You woke up at four o'clock. You, you were in the fields when the sun was up. You weren't sitting in the fields eating your porridge or whatever it was. You started the day when the sun was up, and that's that was industry. That was harvest. That was how people did what they were paid to do, and that was where they got their eight hours work and, and things like that. Then they would go to bed when the sun set with their candlelight or, or whatever else. The idea of burning the candle at both ends 
was a term that started in uh, France in around about the 1500s because it was considered to be extravagant to burn a candle at both ends because wax was expensive, but it meant you were actually working well into the night with candlelight. So put the finishing touches on the end of each day with the idea of evanescence. And as I say, for me right now, I will do that. And then I will say three things that I'm very, very grateful for. Not just that I that I thought, you know, the sun was out, but I really appreciate from today. And I find that that helps get me off to sleep. Uh, I did offer a sleep meditation to anybody who wanted to listen to it. And I, a few people took me up on that, which is great. So similarly, uh, if you guys would like to know what the eight E's are in a bulletproof, uh, bulletproof or a bullet point, I should say, perspective, I'm happy to send that to you. I have a bit of an excerpt on that. And when I first bought out the eight E's of equilibrium, the people have asked me about that. The uptake was brilliant. Uh, again, it's david at leeway.com.au. Just send me an email and I will get back to you and everyone who knows that I have uh, gotten back to them. Similarly, I've got a, I'll put a link in there if you like for a 15-minute chat. I had some really good conversations last week with people around uh, or the last couple of weeks ago around what I spoke about then and even things that have just come up. Very, very happy to help out in those areas. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's another great opportunity I've had to talk with you fellas. I'm impressed by the amount of people who've turned up. Uh, the one percent as Ben calls them. I, I, I like to say that I believe 99% of people on this planet just don't get how to live this life. Only 1% do. And I like to work with the 1% who do because the 1% who get how to live life, 90% of them don't do it. And so if you're one of those 1% who gets out of work life, this life out, but you know you're one of the 99% that aren't doing it, facts, see, facts, as they say, do it if you say you will do it. If you keep struggling with not doing what it is that you say you will do, hit me up, send me an email, david at leeway.com.au. Happy to have a chat on how we can get around helping you to do that. But apart from that, gentlemen, uh, I've enjoyed having a conversation. Love the feedback when I get it. Uh, but send me an email, david at leeway.com.au. Have a wonderful uh, start to the week. Everybody wake up early tomorrow morning. Have one scoop of pre-workout, not three. Uh, bang on through that workout. Keep it going. Tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life. 